未来に至る前に今一度帰るがいいお前の原風景にそして知るのだお前自身が何者であるのか<笑>あれみんな帰っちゃったのかな今日はお城見に行こうって言ってたのにいいや一人で行こうあれれおかしいな迷っちゃったぞねえおばあさんお城どっちこっちありがとうそうそう坊やの友達が先に行って待ってるってさところに来ちゃったぞ。あの城へ行くただ一つの道さこれがあの城へ向かう者はここに倒れている人間を踏みしだいていくかさもなきゃこの中の一人になっちまうしかないんだよ What would you do to fulfill a dream? Some people say that if you work hard enough through a sheer effort alone you can overcome any obstacle Others say the limit is only your imagination and you need a dream bigger And as you're watching this Your favorite YouTube guru is saying, Buy my course and I'll teach you how to sell a course that teaches other people how to sell a course. But perhaps some dreams are so far off in the distance that no matter how hard you work, no matter how big your dream is, no matter how many Ty Lopez courses you buy, there remains virtually no chance of success for you. And in your moment of desperation and hopelessness, you might turn to a darker alternative. Let me ask you, What do you think it might mean to sell your soul to the devil? The standard theory about how such a transaction would take place would be to go out into the woods at midnight, draw a pentagram in the dirt, call out to the pits of hell to negotiate a deal for your soul. However, the main religions of the world would argue that to make such a deal is more simple than that. You see, in order to win an unholy advantage, you simply have to be willing to do anything. By anything, I mean you need to be honest. And then, when it's to your advantage, you should cheat. When it's necessary, you should be kind. And then, when it's in your interest to do so, you should be cruel. When you see a beggar on the street, give him two dollars. And when he's not looking, take three. Remembering the words of Pang Tong to Liu Bei, to adhere to the idea of abstract rectitude is to do nothing. One must be an opportunist. Annex the weak, attack the willfully deluded, seize the recalcitrant, and protect the docile. These were the teachings of the great kings of Tang and Wu. If you make the land a great country, will you be guilty of a breach of trust? Remember, if you don't take it now, another will. So, to sell your soul to the devil in the end could simply be thought of as a metaphor rather than a physical act. It's an indication that you'd be willing to part with the most precious aspect of your humanity, which frankly is your ability to distinguish right from wrong, good from bad, justice from injustice. And if you blur that line, so too will you blur the line between you and your animal self. Your animal self, run by the reptilian part of the brain, deals with the most primal urges power, lust, greed, envy. And whilst you may live, you will die a spiritual death. To further this point, the Obey believed that in order to win the realm, you must win the hearts of the people. But when he was going nowhere and decided instead to resort to conniving and betrayal, would he not only continue the cycle of instability that led to the collapse of the Han in the first place? Take, for instance, his dealings with the Southlands regarding Jing province. 
Although Sun Quan and Zhou Yu were no saints, the trickery employed by Zhuge Liang to win control of Jing province wouldn't go unpunished. Zhuge Liang and Liu Bei were able to delay the consequences of their actions for a long time, but eventually, the Southlands would get so fed up with Zhuge Liang and Liu Bei's shenanigans that they would take Jing province in a sneak attack, resulting in the death of Guan Yu. In the end, everything that Liu Bei's fought for would be in vain. But how dare I preach, really? How dare I be so self-righteous? Let's try to understand the point of view from Liu Bei's perspective now. In the time that he is living in, it literally seems as if the world is ending. Why the world? Why not just China? Because on all sides of China are the impenetrable barriers of the Pacific Ocean, the dense rainforests of Southeast Asia, the Himalayan mountains and the Gobi Desert, leaving them as the only speck of consciousness in this great expanse of nothingness. This isn't a war, this is a world war. Let me blow your mind. If you count the entire period from the beginning of the Yellow Turban Rebellion to the end of the Three Kingdoms period, the next deadliest conflict after this is World War II. Now you might disagree because this is a period of around 100 years, but might I remind you, there were much less people back then, and such an occurrence can be likened to a meteor hitting the earth or a global ice age. It wouldn't be until the Tang Dynasty 500 years later that China will recover and return to the same population levels of the time of the Han. There's a reason why you've never heard of the Jin and the Sui Dynasty, which were the periods between the Han and the Tang. These two periods weren't known for any particular accomplishments. Why is that? It's almost as if China went back in time after the Three Kingdoms period. When you live in a pre-industrial era where 9 people are required to feed 10 people, that small amount of excess labor would have been your doctors, scientists, historians, bureaucrats, priests, your merchant class. So what happens if there's a significant population decrease? Well, these intellectuals are going to have to go back to their fields and pick grain, and the whole of your civilized society collapses. Liu Bei isn't seeming like such a bad guy now. What do you think? Liu Bei just wants nothing more than to end this madness, this living hell that the world is going through and return to prosperity, so he's changed his ideals. So, Returning to the story, Liu Bei is informed that Guan Yu has died. He's totally grief-stricken and he can't eat, sleep or drink. A total wreck of a human being. With the loss of Jing province and his best friend, so much of what he's fought for has gone to waste. And for him, there's only one thing on his mind. You see, him, Guan Yu and Zhang Fei weren't playing when they made the Oath of the Peach Garden. They swore eternal brotherhood so they may restore the hand and die on the same day neither of which has been accomplished. And in his duty to his sworn brother, he can do but one thing, revenge. In his eulogy to Guan Yu, quote, In the Peach Garden, I and my brothers Guan Yu and Zhang Fei pledged ourselves to live and die together. Unhappily, my brother Guan Yu came to his end at the hands of Sun Quan of Wu, and I must avenge him lest I fail to fulfill the oath. Therefore will I devote the whole force of my kingdom to the destruction of Wu and the capture of the rebellious chief. Dire vengeance will I wreak. Zhuge Liang, however, would object to this. Enmity with Cao Cao is a public matter. Vengeance for the manner of your brother's end is private. The empire should be placed first. Meanwhile, in the Southlands, Sun Quan is informed of the conquest of Jing, but the taste of victory for him is too bitter. Being responsible for the death of Guan Yu, one can only imagine the storm of vengeance coming his way. He's terrified out of his mind for the consequences to come. 
to avenge the humiliation of Zhou Yu and claim Jing was a primary objective for the Southlands, but now Liu Bei isn't the same puny lord that he once knew. Despite the loss of Jing, he's now more than a match for Sun Quan. He has an army of veterans, finely tuned since the time of the Yellow Turban Rebellion, almost a lifetime ago. Now he's got the resources of Yi Province, not to mention having Zhuge Liang. And whilst the Southlands was the leading naval power of the time, the Yangtze River, aka the defensive moat that protected them from Cao Cao's invasion at Red Cliffs, is useless against an attack from Liu Bei's superior land forces to the west. This was a disaster waiting to happen. So Sun Quan has an idea to redirect the wrath of Liu Bei. He decapitates Guan Yu's head and sends it as tribute to Cao Cao. The intention being to imply that Sun Quan killed Guan Yu for Cao Cao's sake. Not an entirely unbelievable alibi considering Guan Yu's attack on Fan Chong. However, upon receiving the Grizzly Trophy, Cao Cao immediately understood he was on the receiving end of this deadly game of hot potato. To show his goodwill to Liu Bei, he instead had a wooden body built and attached the lifeless head of Guan Yu to it, and with this, he buried his old friend, allowing him to rest in peace with dignity. Guan Yu had the fortune of not dying young, which frankly was a huge fortune back in these times. He died at a ripe old age of 60 years old, which might be a bit surprising seeing as you've been watching this series for a total of 2 hours now, but in fact since the time of the first episode, almost 50 years have passed, and with the land now being consolidated amongst these three kingdoms, the original heroes are all old now, with the exception of Sun Quan who was only 26 at the time of the Battle of Red Cliffs. Old Cao Cao is getting on in age, he's suffering from migraines daily, so he sends for the most famous doctor, a doctor still renowned to this day, and whose portrait is often shown in most Chinese medicine stores. His face is also commonly shown on a number of Chinese medicine products. His name is Hua Tuo. He is known to be the originator of many practices, such as determining whether or not a woman is pregnant by reading her pulse, using anesthesia made from cannabis, and performing brain surgery. The results of his examination show that Cao Cao is suffering from a brain tumor, and the cure is a good old fashioned medieval style brain surgery with nothing but a scalpel. Cao Cao has certainly seen his fair share of assassination attempts, especially from his own doctors, so surely this was a naked attempt to do him in. Perhaps the hit was even sanctioned by Liu Bei in retaliation for the death of Guan Yu. As such, instead of receiving a head surgery from Hua Tuo, Cao Cao instead decided to give Hua Tuo a head surgery of his own, and the legendary physician was beheaded. Life isn't without a sense of irony though, and Cao Cao, the great devil, the eternal traitor, the nemesis of the time, without the brain surgery, he dies at the age of 65, leaving his elder son Cao Pi in charge. This is a strange time in the story, perhaps one would even consider it a bit anticlimactic. The hero of the story turns out to be no different to any of the other warlords, and our primary antagonist has just died. A new age of the Three Kingdoms era is now upon us, and with Cao Pi taking over from his father, he decides the time is finally right. It's time to officially end the ancient line of the Han. In the year 220 AD, Emperor Liu Xian is forced to resign as emperor, ending a 400 year line of succession, and Cao Pi crowns himself emperor. When Cao Cao was alive, he never dared do this due to the unspoken loyalty to the Han, but almost two generations have passed since Han China was a whole state, and since then fewer and fewer people even remember the Emperor and pay homage to their home state instead. The original ministers of the Han court who were relocated from Luoyang back in part 1 all those years ago have all died off. They've now all been replaced with a younger generation who pays no respect to this forgotten vestige from a bygone era. As such, Cao Pi has free reign to do what he likes and he proclaims his new dynasty Cao Wei. Wei deriving from the name of the province Xucheng is located in and Cao from his surname. Emperor Liu Xian, the last Han Emperor, would be sent into exile and die soon after. Liu Bei hearing this collapses. Imagine you devote your entire life's purpose fighting for a noble cause. You suffer endlessly and overcome many hardships. You finally made some real progress towards attaining your goal 
and all of a sudden, in one day, all of your efforts have been wasted. You were too late. To restore the hand was Liu Bei's all defining purpose, and so much blood had been spilled just to get one third of the way there, only for the Emperor to be deposed and the dynastic line to officially end. How do you even continue to live after such an event occurring? You see, this isn't a setback that could be made up for. The dream is dead. There's no longer a hand to save. Furthermore, without Cao Cao, there's no traitor holding the Emperor hostage anymore. There is no single point of villainy to destroy in order to end the chaos. History has turned a page, and Liu Bei is now a vestige of an older time who recalls the good old days of the Han. Whilst the people on the other hand, living in the current era, they've already moved on. The Emperor, being forced to step down without resistance from the people, indicates that the support for the Emperor has essentially died. Along with that, the legitimacy of Liu Bei's cause. He has no reason to fight anymore, let alone a reason to live. With his highest ideal in life being swept away, all that he has fought for has been in vain. He's left numb and cold. The only emotion that he registers now, the only feeling that he's been left with, now that everything's been taken away from him, is the desire for revenge. First though, the affairs of the state need to be put in order. Everyone around him, particularly Zhuge Liang, begs Liu Bei to become emperor, to oppose the right of rule of the Wei ruler. Liu Bei is disgusted when he hears this. His only goal was to restore the emperor, not become the emperor. How could he dare to usurp the throne? But Zhuge Liang tells him, passively sitting by and allowing Cao Pi to become emperor will only add to his legitimacy. But most importantly, being a scion of the royal house, Liu Bei could continue the legacy of the Han in his own name. Liu Bei is extremely conflicted, but being begged by all the officials of his realm and having the support from the people, he declared himself emperor in 221 AD, naming his new dynasty Shu Han. Shu being the older name of Yi province and Han, indicating it's in the line of succession of the original Han dynasty. At his imperial inauguration, he once again declares to all his desire for revenge against the Southlands. Amongst all the officers, it was Zhao Zilong that would speak up to stay this madness. The real rebel was not Sun Quan, but Cao Cao. Now it is his son who has usurped the imperial throne and called forth the anger of gods and humans. If you leave Wei out of consideration to fight Wu, how will you defend the realm? But the new emperor responds, Sun Quan slew my brother. I hate him so much that I could eat his flesh with gusto and devour his relatives, whereby I shall have my vengeance. Why, noble sir, do you obstruct me otherwise? Despite this heartfelt intervention, Liu Bei was set in his way. But it wasn't just Zhao Zilong that opposed this. Zhuge Liang and all the ministers were deeply opposed to this war and would spare no effort in convincing their lord to take his wrath out on Wei instead. Meanwhile, Zhang Fei in Langjiang had heard of all that happened and it was deeply depressed. He didn't spend a single waking moment sober, drinking so hard that he often fell into a blind rage and savagely beat his own troops. He resented Zhuge Liang for restraining Liu Bei from fulfilling their filial oath. What's the point of making a sacred oath if you have no intention of fulfilling it, he thought. Although they weren't related by blood, they swore brotherhood. They slept on the same bed together, ate from the same plate, and swore to die on the same day. Zhang Fei's behavior was becoming more and more unstable. Although war hadn't been declared yet, he drilled his troops non-stop in preparation for his brother's revenge. His training was so intense and would often arbitrarily enforce corporal punishments for minor infractions. Two of his generals would be caught up in this. Fan Jiang and Zhang Da were given an unrealistic task to complete by a certain time. 
they were to prepare tens of thousands of white uniforms so the troops could march on the Southlands wearing clothes fit for a funeral. However, the time given to them wasn't enough to complete the task, so they were savagely beaten and warned if they didn't complete the task the very next day, they would be executed. With the two generals' fate sealed, they discussed the only way to escape their impending doom and save themselves, and it seems they had no other choice. In the middle of the night, they snuck into Jung Fei's tent and assassinated him, helping him fulfill his wish to join his brother in heaven. When the deed was done, they took his head and escaped to the Southlands to offer it as tribute to Sun Quan so they could receive his protection. Liu Bei, hearing this tragic news, collapsed and again couldn't eat, drink or sleep for many days. He was all alone in this world now, without his brothers. As he slowly came to his senses, he received word that the two traitors who had killed Zhang Fei had gone off with his brother's decapitated head to Sun Quan. With this, there could be no more restraint. Despite the loss of his two most able generals, Liu Bei summoned a host of 750,000 men. It comprised a veteran force and navy and Hmong tribespeople that lived in the state of Shu and began their invasion, leaving Zhao Zilong behind to defend the supply route and Zhuge Liang to manage the affairs of Shu and defend against Wei during the emperor's absence. In the capital of the Southlands, Jian Ye, Sun Quan briefs the officials of the current situation. Liu Bei has declared himself emperor and is leading against us in person a great host of more than 700,000. Being faced with this doom, the officials all turned pale and no one had the courage to speak up. All except Zhu Ge Jin. He asked Sun Quan to let him conduct one last attempt at diplomacy before giving up all hope. Sun Quan agrees to this, so Zhu Ge Jin heads to Bai Di Cheng to meet with Liu Bei on the eve of invasion and tells him thus, when Guan Yu attacked Xiangyang, Cao Cao wrote again and again urging my master to attack Jingzhou, but the Marquis was unwilling and it was the enmity between your brother and Lu Meng that led to the attack on Jingzhou as your brother refused to hand over the region as you had promised. My master is now very sorry for it, but the death of Guan Yu was Lu Meng's doing. However, Lu Meng is now dead from illness and his enmity has died with him. To make amends, willing to hand over the men responsible for Zhang Fei's murder, and not only that, willing to restore Jingzhou in full back to you. If we ally ourselves once more, then we may join forces against Cao Pi and punish his usurpation. This is a very reasonable offer and explanation. Sun Quan never ordered the death of either of his brothers. Guan Yu did in fact die as a result of him not carrying out the orders Liu Bei had given him to hand over the eastern three provinces of Jing, and as a result, Jing was invaded by the Southlands and he was killed in battle by Lu Meng as a result. Furthermore, Sun Quan had nothing to do with Zhang Fei's death. In addition, Liu Bei has the opportunity to reclaim Jing without a drop of blood being spilled and the position on the map can be reset to where it was before. However, unfortunately for Zhuge Jin, Liu Bei wasn't after reconciliation. You of East Wu killed my brother, yet you dare come with your artful talk. The slayer of my brother shall not live in the same world as I, and I will only cease when I have slain your master. Were it not for the sake of your brother, I would behead you at once. When the negotiations having failed, Zhuge Jin returned empty-handed. At this time, Sun Quan had also reached out to Cao Pi to form an alliance, and amazingly, Cao Pi agreed to this, yet he did nothing. It was clear the way were nothing more than to pop a bag of popcorn and watch the shit show unfold. The Southlands would fight alone, and the invasion would begin. Sun Quan called his generals to ask who would volunteer to lead the defense. No one raised their hand. Sadly, the Southlands renowned commander Zhou Yu had already died, and he passed the torch on to Lu Su, who shortly held the position. He was old and sickly though, and he would die soon later passing the responsibility once more to Lu Meng. With Lu Meng also having died from illness, there was no one capable of leading a defense and the Southlands seemed helpless. The responsibility of this huge task fell on the young man Sun Huan, a cousin of Sun Quan. He was sent with 50,000 soldiers to defend the city of Zigui, the first city in the line of attack. But like a tsunami, the defenses of Zigui 
washed away like they were nothing and Sun Quan would lose some able generals and precious troops. The cities in the Southland were thrown into confusion and the population became panicked, selling all their assets and marrying off their daughters. As Liu Bei tore through the countryside of Jing, Sun Huan determined to make a desperate defense at the city of Yiling, or die trying. Liu Bei had to move carefully though. The Southlands were still yet to employ their most able generals or their navy. Furthermore, their supply lines are being extended daily and a slow drawn out conflict wouldn't be suitable. So Liu Bei sent Zheng Bao, son of Zheng Fei, to besiege Yiling, but he gave him only a small force so as not to actually take Yiling but to lure the Southlands into sending all their reinforcements into fighting a decisive battle with Shu. Sun Quan dispatched his best generals Han Deng, Zhou Tai, Gan Ning, Ling Tong, Cheng Pu with 100,000 troops to reinforce Yiling. Huang Zhong, Liu Bei's 75-year-old veteran Tiger General, had heard a rumor his lord was complaining of old and incapable leaders, a statement not directed at him, but that didn't stop Huang Zhong from taking offense. He felt he was still in the prime of his youth, able to eat 10 pounds of meat daily and pull the 200 pound bow, and it was time for him to prove that no matter his age, he was still worthy of being one of the great Tiger Generals of Shu. So he saddled up and led the assault against the incoming Southlands reinforcements. Huang Zhong pursued some 10 miles, but presently he fell into an ambush and found himself attacked from all sides. Zhou Tai to the left, Hang Dang to the right, Ling Tong from behind, Pan Zhang from the front, so he was surrounded and he was hit with an arrow as he tried to escape. Luckily, reinforcements from Shu made it in time to save the old general, taking advantage of their broken up formation. The Shu army, along with its Mang tribesmen allies, fought a long and bloody battle with the Southlands army. In the end, Shu annihilated the Southlands forces, and it was a massacre, resulting in the deaths of some of their leading generals such as Cheng Pu, a hero from the Battle of Red Cliffs at the hands of the Hmong tribesmen. This plummeted the morale of the Southlands remaining forces. With Sun Huan besieged the Yiling and the catastrophes of their fates building up, a new Grand Commander needs to be selected. Lu Shun. Despite his experience in the Battle of Red Cliffs and his critical role in the successful invasion of Jing, he isn't very well liked. He's only 27 years old compared to the much older veterans he's in charge of, and he's labelled as a simple bookworm for his passion for military theory. To put such a person in charge at such a critical time indicates to all that the Southlands is desperate. Lu Xun employs a strategy of a war of attrition. He builds an endless string of forts to slow down the enemy in order to buy him more time. When his subordinates see his plan in action, however, they lose all respect for him, as his plan implies that he is simply delaying an inevitable defeat. When his forts were built, the generals were ordered only to defend, and only at the last minute when they're about to be defeated are they allowed to retreat to the next fort, but then never to attack. The losses of these temporary forts, however, would badly weaken the morale of the Southlands troops, and everyone in the command structure would resent him. All except Sun Quan, who would maintain an unquavering faith in him. Despite all objections, Lu Xun would keep building these forts and abstain from direct combat. Although the Shu war machine were able to smash these defenses, the momentum of their approach was slowed down and each fort they took acted as a tiny cut and these tiny cuts would become more and more numerous as Shu pushed into Jing territory. The hope was that once they crossed the Yiling Mountains, it'd be all flat terrain from then on and defense would be impossible against such a powerful force. But with each fort that was taken, another one would simply be built 30 miles away. Shu, having to rely on speed of attack and brute force to overcome the deficit of their extended supply lines, knew that they were in a race against time, so they threw everything they had at these fortifications like their lives depended on it. On the Southland side, however, the large loss of territory, the piling up of losses and lost forts was almost enough to spark a mutiny against Lu Xun. His generals who were kept in the dark about his plans beg him to tell them so at least they could uphold troop morale so they could feel like they are fighting and dying for some good cause. So he tells them, their last line of defense is Shouting Hill, which at this rate will likely fall in two months from now. The goal is simply wear the opponent down as much as possible until then. Time is the enemy for both Shu and the Southlands, and they will desperately race against the clock. After almost two months had passed, the Southlands were on the last line of their defense. Lu Xun made a pledge that from this point on, there shall be no more retreating and they will fight to the death. Once Shu makes it past Ealing Mountains, the last of their defenses will fall and Jing will capitulate, followed by the Southlands. 
Despite the Shu soldiers being exhausted after two months of besieging fort after fort, Liu Bei has each unit prepare a dare to die squadron for the purposes of taking the last of the Southlands forts within three days. The two armies desperately struggled against each other, but five days passed and the Shu army was forced to stop and rest. Daily, the Shu troops would come out and taunt them in their forts, leading to some of the forts being lost as a result of a lack of discipline, but this last line of forts were still standing. Being in the blazing heat of summer though, water sources turned bad, and the Shu soldiers being camped directly beneath the unforgiving sun, it was thought best to move the camps to a wooded area so the troops could have protection from the elements. These camps totaled around 40, over a 100 mile stretch of forest. Lu Xun, observing the array of the Shu camps, saw that finally, after months of retreating, the lucky opportunity has finally come to go on the offensive. Seeing that the time was right to finally strike, he said, this plan of mine would not hoodwink Zhuge Liang, but luckily, he is not here. His absence will allow me to score a great success. Each of his Southland soldiers is to carry a bundle of straw mixed with sulfur and saltpeter along with tinder. When they reach the shoe camps, they are to start a fire at half of the camps, leaving the other half untouched. And when the fires are lit, they are to advance where the fires aren't burning. Just then, a report came into Liu Bei's camp that some of the troops of Wu could be seen very far off going along the hills. The Southlands, having never made a single advance since the beginning of the invasion, and Liu Bei seeing himself on the brink of victory thought this must be a petty ruse to buy them more time as they had been doing the whole length of the war. A gentle breeze came from the east, and fire had sprung up on the camp just left of Liu Bei's. People were sent to help put it out, but just as it was extinguished, another fire would spring up to the right. As the wind became stronger, the fire got into the trees and became uncontrollable. The soldiers of the burning camps were rushing to escape to the safety of Liu Bei's own camp to escape the fire. And in their confusion, they trampled on each other so that many died. It's very hard to imagine for us that humans are also capable of stampedes like animals are. Six to seven people in a two meter square area can create up to a thousand pounds of pressure, more than enough to break your neck or cause asphyxiation. Imagine, tens of thousands of people in a small area running in the same direction for their lives. Someone is bound to fall over at some stage, maybe because they tripped on a rock or were pushed. The person immediately behind him is going to trip over that person and the person behind him is being pushed by a swarm of people and he doesn't have enough time to react to the people who have fallen on the ground. Maybe he accidentally steps on your hand or steps on your skull before he gets pushed over himself and has the same thing happen to him. You have no chance of getting up as hundreds of feet are going to grind you into the dirt and in this maximum state of fear, you can't expect anyone to stop and help you up lest they also end up face down in the dirt with you. As the sea of panicked humans escape this raging inferno and each other, the troops of Wu close in to complete the slaughter. Ignorant of how many enemy there might be, Liu Bei made a dash towards them, but amongst the burning trees, movement was almost impossible. Just as the battle began, Ma Liang had arrived back to Chengdu to report to Zhuge Liang of the layout of Liu Bei's camps. He says, our lord has committed those very faults which the rules of the art of war lay down as to be particularly avoided. The camps are made where free movement is impossible and nothing can save him if the enemy uses fire. Besides, what defense is possible along a 200 mile front? Disaster is at hand and Lu Xun sees it all. Go back as quickly as you can and tell our lord that it must be changed at once. However, it'd be too late for Ma Liang to tell Liu Bei of Zhuge Liang's advice. The wind had turned into a powerful gale that was blowing westward in the direction of Shu, and along with the dry summer condition, the forest was an endless source of dry tinder and the entirety of Liu Bei's 40 camps were consumed by fire, and all order was lost amongst the troops. Besides the contingent of 100,000 men used to deter an attack from Wei, every last Southland's reinforcement was deployed to make an end of the invading Shu force once and for all. As the situation became critical for Shu, the siege on Yiling was finally lifted and the defenders came out and joined the offensive. The Shu army was forced to flee for their lives and many courageous generals would make suicidal rearguard actions to ensure the safety of the fleeing troops. The Obey would even order his troops to strip naked and use their clothes to make lines of fire to slow down the pursuing Southland troops. Despite this effort though, the Southlands 
would maneuver up the river to surround their enemy and intercept their escape. Liu Bei thought that surely this would be his end. But just as the worst was to come, they saw the enemy soldiers suddenly begin to break up and scatter. Soon the reason became clear. A fearsome warrior leading a small force came out to the rescue of Liu Bei. The rescuer was none other than Zhao Zilong. He'd been sent to Zhengzhou when Zhuge Liang became worried about the arrangement of Liu Bei's camps. And so the news of his defeated lord reached him there. Just in the nick of time, Liu Bei was whisked off to safety back to Bai Dicheng. As soon as Lu Xun heard that Zhao Zilong had appeared, he ordered his troops to temporarily stop the pursuit and regroup. The war was finally won, and Lu Xun would be exalted as one of the great generals of the Three Kingdoms period. But anxious to push his advantage as far as possible, Lu Xun led his victorious army westward towards Shu for a counterattack. But as he drew near to Kui Pass, his horse became spooked by an eerie presence. He felt an aura of death on the mountainside, so he sent scouts to check ahead for an ambush. But his scouts reported that no soldiers were spotted, but near the riverbank, there were hundreds of mysterious looking boulders. They rode down to examine this mysterious arrangement of stones, which formed a circle. And going in to get a closer look, they went in amongst the stones. But as Lucian glanced around to look for an exit from this mysterious formation, a sudden whirlwind of dust came up, obscuring their vision and causing them to become lost. And in this whirlwind, the stones themselves came to life and suddenly grew into steep mountains shaped like swords. Being hemmed in on all sides, they couldn't get out, and the dust storm suddenly became like waves crashing in the ocean. There was then a roaring sound around them, as if there was an enemy army with war drums ready to attack. They stumbled around confused and frightened, desperate to escape, but just as it seemed as if they had found the exit, they would find themselves at the exact point they started. As the sun began to set, the exhausted victims were becoming delirious, and at this point, a wise old man appeared out of nowhere to Lu Xun. The old man led the way out and showed Lu Xun and his men out to safety. Looking back at the stone circle, they came out, and everything looked as the same as when they first saw it, and whatever happened inside only happened in their minds. When outside, the wise old man explained, this was known as a stone sentinel maze, based on the eight gates concept written about in the Book of Changes, of which Zhuge Liang is an expert in. Only one of the gates will allow them to escape safely, and so the old man led them out through the gate of life. Concentric stone circles have been seen in every part of the world, from Stonehenge in England to Africa and Mesoamerica. What they truly are still remains a mystery. To the amazement of all, Lucian gave orders to return back to the Southlands, not entirely as a result of Zhuge Liang's pagan rock formation, but due to concerns of a growing threat from Wei, so they stopped their pursuit and returned home. And only a day later would their fears be confirmed. Three armies moving towards the border of the Southlands, Saoran to Rushu, Saoshou to Dongkou, and Saojen to Nanjun. Luckily, Sun Quan has already anticipated an opportunistic way, and with the army already in key position to defend against the assault, the Southlands would not be easily overcome. Despite the battering they received from their war with Shu, their morale was now sky high, and unlike the war with Shu, a war with the north allows them to use the Yangtze River as a protective moat, as it had done at the time of the Battle of Red Cliffs. Also, their superior navy was able to be used in full effect, and such the Wei forces were easily defeated, resulting in huge casualties for Wei. In the end, who won? Despite the Southlands having been victorious twice against its two neighbours, it suffered the brunt of two wars and didn't gain anything besides its continued survival. As for Wei, despite having the privilege of taking the back seat, watching Shu and the Southlands mutually destroy each other, they weren't able to capitalise on this once in a lifetime advantage and when they did act, they only suffered a terrible defeat. And lastly, Shu, led by Liu Bei, had no strategic purpose in its invasion against Shu. A war motivated by unbridled vengeance would simply not allow for real success to be attained, as the goal wasn't victory, but destruction. On all sides, nothing was gained, but so much was lost. Meanwhile, in Bai Di Cheng, Liu Bei reflects on his defeat and is deep in depression. Thinking a lot of Zhuge Liang and how he'd snubbed his loyal minister's advice, he became solitary, wallowing in his grief for all that he'd suffered, and in the end his deep sadness leaves him sickly to the point of death. So he finally summons Zhuge Liang for his last will and testament, and bade him come near 
and sit beside him. He patted his old friend on the back and told him, "I have all that I have because I listened to you in the past. Little thought you that I should prove so stupid as to not follow your advice and so bring about the late disasters. But I am deeply sorry." He handed his will to Zhuge Liang, and with a sigh he said, "I'm no great scholar, but the teacher has said, 'A bird's song is sad when the death is near, and a dying person's words are good.'" Although my son is a degenerate, I trust that you will instruct and guide my son. If my son can be helped, help him. But if he proves to be a fool, then take the throne yourself and become the ruler. The responsibility to safeguard the kingdom and complete our great mission lies with you now. But such a statement caused a cold sweat to break out all over Zhuge Liang, and he collapsed to his knees. He will never forget his loyalty to his master. I will instead wear myself to the bone. And service of your son until death. Zhao Zilong, hearing this, would also swear his service to Liu Bei's son. The fidelity of the dog and the horse is mine to give, and it shall now be his. With these last words, Liu Bei, weaver of mats, emperor of Shu, the great adventurer of his time, would die at the age of 63 in 222 A.D. Tang poet Fu Du would write of him. 蜀主愧无醒善暇，本年已在永安宫。遂化祥象恐善离，欲见虚无也寺中。古庙山松潮水鹤，碎石浮蜡走春翁。吴侯此屋长林尽，衣啼准臣。祭祀童。Who will be victorious in the end? There's only one part left, guys. Stay tuned. I highly suggest you subscribe if you haven't already. Also, if you like this video, please remember to give a like. It really helps me out a lot. Again, thanks for watching, guys, and I'll see you in the next video. Peace.